Okay, we're back. So the name of the game for this uh, uh, this video is going to be putting it together. And basically you have, when you're beginning drawing, you have three main kind of things. You have objects, you have environments, um, and under environments you have perspective. and you have landscape. Now, obviously all of these, well, maybe not obviously, but all of these do have something to do with each other. Okay, and um, we're gonna go through and explain some of the ways that that happens. Remember from the very beginning, we were talking about basic shapes, you know, rectangles, triangles, circles. Um, we quickly ditch circles and use parts of them um, very rarely do we use a perfect circle. Uh, most of the time we use ellipses, right? Things like this. And then we use our basic forms, which are made up of components of this. So if we're drawing a box form, and we're th showing three sides of the box, really what we're doing is we're drawing triangles that are kind of cut off. And that makes a convincing box. To make a cylinder, we use an ellipse and an arc. Um, which can also be thought of to connect, start connecting these as a box with an ellipse on top and an arc on the bottom. Okay. Then when you have a cone, you can think of it as a triangle plus an ellipse. When you have a sphere, you have the circle plus an ellipse to make it actually round, right? Um, sphere is kind of the flattest one. Those are the four basics that most people teach. Um, in addition, uh, most teachers now use the prism as being a good example of something that's incredibly useful because you can stack the prism on things like you can take the prism and turn it into a house really quickly. Um, Let's see, what else? You also have the pyramid. Um, you know, I don't see the pyramid come up a lot, especially as a full thing. Rarely do you see the, the actual full pyramid. Usually what happens is you're doing some box drawing and you're setting up a box, right? And you And you've done that, then when you're drawing an object, maybe you see that it's got part of a pyramid and it connects right to the box. So you tend to see that sort of thing more often. In fact, that could be useful for drawing houses. Um, and then you've got the ribbon, which you could draw just sort of like a simple arc like this. You could draw the ribbon as an S-curve. Okay. The, and these forms begin to show up in a bunch of different places and in a bunch of different ways. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that when you look at these forms, every single one of these forms has a basic silhouette, right? A basic shape to it and that basic shape is really important to keep in mind as you draw so let's say that you're using the cylinder and you're going to draw a tree trunk right so you can imagine that the tree trunk is very cylindrical and then when you get a root coming out of it that's cylindrical too, right? Then these tree trunks might actually twist. So you're using a little bit of the idea of a ribbon here. And then as they twist and go up, they might actually turn into branches. Okay. So then what matters here is you start to get the silhouette of the tree and you start to fork off 
all of these things, all right? So we've begun to think of using multiple cylinders together, sort of wrapping around each other, right, in an organic way to create a tree. And then if we think about trees in a sort of flattish way, we could say, well, okay, well, we have a tree or part of a tree coming down here, right? Maybe it's like a broken off trunk or something. Or a piece of a trunk. You know, already that looks fairly tree-ish, right? But then we could say, well, all right, we're going to take some lines and start wrapping around, converting this into dimension, adding some lines to kind of help bring us forward, right? So we're going to show us full form. And then here, since this is coming up, we're going to show this overlapping everything and going away from us. See, that's kind of cool. So this, we might want to give just a little bit of a form here. And maybe this goes away too. But then this, maybe this isn't the emphasis of our drawing, and so we just keep this flat. So within one object, we can kind of think of all this as having different kind of components to create different effects and feels, right? We can play them off each other for effect, you know? Now, um, there's interesting things that you can do with simple shapes, right? So most people, when they draw a tree in elementary school, they do something like this, right? They do these little loopies, and then they cut it off like that. kind of forgetting that there's a basic uh, rule of overlapping here. And remember this diagram that you've probably seen before and everybody shows. It's basically the, the overlap diagram. And that concept is probably one of the most important concepts you could get across. So what this tree is showing us is that we have this shape and this shape. And we don't really see an overlap per se because the shapes sort of end at defined points. The overlap diagram, you'll notice, is that you, the ending is implied there. Um, so if you wanted to create like an overlap with this circle here, you would want something to kind of continue through it, right? Or you would want something like this, where the circle clearly overlaps a defined shape, okay? So these are kind of problematic things that you've learned in drawing before and we need to kind of fix. So that's the question of, well, you know, how do you do that? How do you overlap a tree properly? So let's say you have your tree trunk coming down. We're using a more organic tree shape. You know, first off, I think you kind of transition it and arc it into the ground. Because one of the interesting things is, let's say this is the ground line, and this is our massive oak tree right here. Typically, the root system goes out and takes up about as much space as the tree above. Root systems are very massive, and they go into very tiny roots. So what you think about is, it'll create this like mound kind of around the tree and it'll create all these ridges where the roots are just underground. Um, and I think that's really fascinating. Now, this is something you would kind of use more for a foreground tree, right? In your um, 
and something that you wanted to emphasize. Another way to think about grounding that tree, making it more sophisticated, is you bring that tree to the ground Let's do it a little more like that. Bring that tree to the ground, transition it a little bit, and then you can hide that with grasses. Right? This is another very simple and effective way of, of doing this. Then you can come up and add to your tree, right? So this is dealing with the ground of the tree. I think the ground of the tree is a really simple and easy application of where you might use these kind of techniques. Now, what about the actual branches of the tree? So let's say that you start with a tree shape that's kind of squarish, but a little organic, right? And then one of the things to make it more interesting and organic to look at is if you offset the tree trunk from the center, then what you can start to do is play with the silhouette and start to like push it out and push it in from that general shape sticking to the general shape right you can use little flowy lines and things because trees aren't perfectly shaped right Now, the question is, what do you do here, right? Well, then I think you need to think about lighting. Typically what happens is you get lighting um, in an image that comes up from 45 degrees, basically. So let's say we're getting like an upper left light and it's kind of the lights in front of the tree. So it's, it's more of a front lit situation. So then we think of like, okay, well, with a, with a sphere, right? If we're getting a front lit situation, it's going to do that, and this is going to be the shadow side. So we take all that work that we've done with rendering spheres in this super boring way, and we bring it over here, and we say, well, generally speaking, we're going to have a line that goes this way. But it has to be more tree-ish, right? It can't be that, that boring. So we kill that line, and we keep that line in our head. right? And if you need the line, you can put it there. And then we kind of do this in a tree-ish way with some textures, breaking it up, and so on. But basically we adhere to that. And then we say, well, maybe there's like a little area within here that's gonna catch light. And then there's probably some darker areas that are gonna happen over here within the light side of the tree, right? So then we can come in and we can do, you know, basic hatching or just put some tone down with a pencil And that's going to create an actually a pretty quick, nice tree silhouette sketch. And then we can bring that down here, right? And then depending on how much ground we see, right? We want some ground to overlap in the background. And then we may see some shadow on the ground cast from the tree, right? Depending. Now, Let's say that we're actually drawing this, this tree shadow here, right? Um, and we're going to take this tree shadow and, ad and adapt it here. So let's say this is all going to be a tree shadow. So we say, well, okay, back here, there's going to be, this is going to be kind of the outer boundary of the tree shadow, and this would be like the front boundary of the tree shadow. So what we want is for the actual shadow itself to have a shape. So what you'll notice if you if you kind of get near the ground and look at a grassy field is when you see something in shadow, you'll see a dark bits of grasses sticking up, right? And then where the shadow begins over here, 
you'll actually kind of see the opposite. You'll see like little light bits of grass come up, right? And so what you could do if you're working analog is use your eraser to kind of cut those out. And, uh, you know, if you're working with a pen or something like that, you just have to basically create a, a silhouette for these and make sure that under it stays light. So this actually is another application of overlap. So we're taking basically, you know, a really organic crazy shape like this. And then we're taking a darkened second really organic crazy shape and putting it behind it, right? And then all of a sudden that looks like grass in light and grass in shadow overlapping each other. Okay, then when you go into um, more landscape type stuff and you're taking a wider view of things, right? The same concept happens, right? So you can think of taking basic triangles like this, going back and overlapping in space, or going like this and overlapping each other. And you start to create um, sort of a mountain landscape, right? So you could think of this as saying, well, all right, let me say this is my landscape format. And I've got my horizon about here. I could have, you know, hills coming in here and here. Hills overlapping like that and like that. I could have mountains, like background mountains kind of going in. Right? Then I could have clouds showing up. This is all kind of generic, right? Now, you see I've got a lot of overlap there, so maybe I won't use overlap in the clouds. I'll just treat them as like sort of floating shapes. You know, instead of overlap, you can use what's called relative size, where if you have, you know, the same size object and it's really small, when you draw it again big, it looks, you know, not overlapping. It looks like it's coming forward. So that's another little non-overlap depth trick, which everybody uses, and you can use them in com combination. Now we talked about the um, the trick in landscape before using overlap, where we take a rock. And remember, we draw these little these little rocky shapes, like kind of like that or something, right? Kind of squared off, having sides. And we can take that rock and we can put it on a hill, right? So we'll take a, a less generic hill here. So we'll take, this is the bottom of the hill, and then the hill is going to come down, boom, roll a little bit like that. So we can think of this rock chilling here on the hill. It's hanging out. So this looks like it's on the hill, right? We could even do some fancy things, like put some grasses in front of it and around it to kind of bring it into that surface of the hill. Then we would want to say, well, so we're not really getting any overlap other than we know that this thing is kind of in front because it's kind of contained, right? Then if we want to get real overlap, we take this rock and we bring this back to our overlap diagram like this, right? Simple. So we take our rock we clear a space for it on the hill. We draw it, and it overlaps the edge of the hill. Then what we do is we flip it. And we do it like this, right? And that gives us this diagram. So we take the rock, we put it on the far edge of the hill. 
So the hill overlaps the rock. So this is the rock walking over the hill trick. And it's a very easy, easy way to take the overlap. And if you can't draw rocks well or hills well, that's okay. You lay it out like this first. Now, um, let's see. So there's more ways that you can use simple shape and overlap, you know, and looking ahead in your drawing career, you might say, well, you know, landscapes, I don't really, I'm not really interested in that. I want to draw freaking characters, right? So you might say, well, okay, let me, I want to, I want to work on like Avatar or Korra. So I might want to draw Tenzin, right? So I might take a simple shape like that and a simple shape like that, components, and begin to draw Tenzin. So I could take very basic, basic shapes. And I could think about overlapping them, right? Do I want to come down this way and I want to cut in for that color, for that uh, cheekbone, right? And then I want to say, well, I know that there's going to be some more jaw there, but what really overlaps everything is the mustache, right? And then you see a little bit of lip, and then there's a beard. Maybe using an older character design as an example. I can't remember what Tenzin actually looked like anymore. But then I put the jaw behind that, right? And then to kind of make it more, you know, avatar-ish, I do that. Okay. So now it's kind of pasted on. Right? This is something that adheres to the form. It doesn't overlap the form. Okay, It just wraps around it. So you can see here that this little bit right here comes in and overlaps. The mustache has to come in and overlap everything. Right? See, these are these are really simple things that people wind up using all the time. And it's really important just to keep in mind kind of like that when you're practicing these objects, that it's not just about objects, it's about everything else too. Um, so think about perspective, right? When you draw a building, you're, let's say you're drawing a box and you just wanna show two sides of the box. You just draw it like this, right? Pretty simple. No big deal. So when you draw a building, what makes you basically do do that exact thing, right? You're just drawing a horizon line. Oops. I'll do that. You're drawing a horizon line. You're drawing a vanishing point. And then you're drawing. the side of a building, right? If you're drawing it in two-point perspective, you're drawing the exact same thing, right? You're just drawing it more precisely, you know? So here we have a building, right? So if this is our eye level, about six feet, means we've put a door on the building, the door is gonna go right there, okay? So what shapes are we drawing? Again, we're drawing triangles. Okay, and then we're cutting off those triangles and making sure they adhere to a good horizon line. All right, so, you know, then you're thinking about overlap. You say, well, let's say I'm doing just a simple one point drawing, right? And I'm using rectangles and I'm going back to the vanishing point like that. I have a, a building here. 
So let's say that this is the front of my image and I start with this building. Well then let's say there's a building behind there. I can go in and quickly cut in a building behind there using what I know about overlap because basically all I'm doing is this. I'm just adding a little receding plane there to make it dimensional. So these are very simple, simple tricks and they, they come up basically everywhere. Um, now let's say that I'm drawing um, that for my, for my um, project, I'm gonna draw a landscape, right? Something like this. Got maybe it maybe it's got like a little stream in it that's coming through or maybe this is a pathway I don't know yet see this is a ribbon right you know or it's gonna be a ribbon because it's the kind of shape that we're gonna use and let's say that I want to you know do a landscape with objects you know what is an object it could be like you know I could be drawing a city park And I may need to draw like, you know, a trash can here. So I might need to be able to draw just a little trash barrel in. Sometimes trash barrels are kind of like mounted with posts. So I might need that kind of that idea that there might be like a post there. There might be grasses in front of it and around it. There might be a shadow on the ground under it. And I may need to put a little bit of tone on that to make sure that it looks shadowy, right? You know, what else could I do? You know, I could start to say, well, all right, here, you know, there's, maybe this is like just a footpath here. Well, I'd, you know, let's say, let's say there's a fence and you want to put a fence line running through here. So you could run through here, you could put a fence line again. The fence is basically a ribbon. Maybe the fence actually like wraps around and down over the hill. So fences have posts. So you just start laying out posts every once in a while. Getting further as we go away, as we know from perspective, right? That, that things that are evenly spaced get closer as we, as we recede in the distance. Then we think, okay, well we have a layout, a basic loose grid for a fence. But what style of fence is it? Maybe it's a, a corral board fence where we have three boards like this that go across. Maybe the posts need to go down a little bit further than that bottom line. And then, of course, you hide the end of the post with the grass. And then we can go down the plane with the grasses if we want to say, well, this is still a hill. So we could do stuff like that lay this out, right? So now we have two, at least two objects in there and that's kind of working out. Then maybe we get, maybe there's a sign right here. Maybe the sign overlaps some of this. And then the sign we can treat as a plane to begin with, right? 
Maybe the sign's staked down in two spots. Maybe the sign has a little bit of depth and we can see a second and third side to the sign. So now we're treating the sign as a box form. Maybe it has a little bit of a border. Okay. And then again, we hide that transition with some grass or whatever. See how this is working? So we're kind of putting things together. Maybe, um, you know, we have a building back here. Maybe it's like the ranger's house. We think, well, okay. It's like the side, maybe it's back here. Maybe it overlaps that hill. So we kick that around. And then maybe it's just a typical like A-frame like that. So here, what form are we drawing? You should know this by now. It is a prism on top of a box form. So that got ugly. So fix that. And then we're looking here to overlap those shapes to show that the roof is really sitting over the house. If you look at that. Okay. So now we're mixing in perspective, right? And kind of a wonky and and fudging it sort of way, but you know, nonetheless, still pot potentially interesting. Then we can say, well, all right, you know, I could consider like a bush to be an object. We kind of treat it like that. It's still basically objecty, right? So then I could start putting in like plants and bushes and populating this thing. So I could say, well, maybe there's a bush in front of the ranger's house right here. There's like little grasses and things over here. You know, tiny lines, right? And then maybe behind the ranger's house, there's like some pine trees. So I can start to knock in the basic shapes. Do a couple layers, right? Little grouping of pine trees. And then maybe there's like more bushes over here kind of behind this hill. Now, like, you know, the edge of this is kind of boring. So maybe this is actually grass here, right? So we're taking that edge and then we're making it a little more organic. And then we can think of, okay, well, maybe we need to like kind of show, at least while we're laying this out, a little bit of perspective on this ground plane here. You know, this is kind of like a, a little bank here. So I see it away. And the pathway is hard packed here, right? So you can see where it's a little flat. Now we can take the idea of overlapping grasses, right? We can put grasses in front of this bank here. We can make a small, bigger as we get close, smaller as we get far. See, kind of cool how that works. And really, you know, for the most part here, we've only been working with overlap. You know, now we can play around with this concept called um, close together and farther away, right? So what we've done here is right here for the ranger's house, we put everything kind of close together, right? And even a lot of the stuff in the foreground is relatively cl close together. But let's say like you know, this is actually located in a mountain valley. And there's like, you know, giant cliffs up here. And 
this place probably doesn't exist really, but let's say that it does. Right here, coming up on a big hill here, a couple of layers that goes back. Or paying attention to how these overlap each other, right? So that we get this sense of progression of going away from us into the scene, right? Maybe we can just see a little bit of horizon back there. So one of the things that we've done here now is we've said we've grouped everything here and then we leave kind of this big empty space here before we start another the end of another shape. So that gives us a little bit of breathing room and allows us to kind of the freedom to kind of explore a lot more. Okay. Now, the other thing to remember when you're doing any kind of object drawing is that to make it less generic, you always want to pay attention to the to the silhouette of something. So let's say you're drawing just um, like a, let's say you're drawing a water bottle, right? And it's got a generic lid for a water bottle. like that. And it comes around, comes down a little bit, and ends like that. Now what makes this recognizable as a particular water bottle as opposed to anything else is the actual outside contour and its proportions. So you notice that you go overlap, this kind of kicks in from the contour and turns in because you have another cylinder form that you're stacking. Then it kicks out, right? And then here, it doesn't just kind of end, it like curves down, right? Comes around, down, curves down. There you go. This is pretty loose. Not exactly the best like drawing on the planet, right? But it's showing you the concept that this, this little indentation is really important. Um, it's just like when you're drawing, you know, uh, a head in three quarters. You can start with the generic head shape, right? You can put eyes in there or whatever. But what really makes it turn is this little edge here, right? That you're starting to overlap some forms this way. So we're talking about putting it all together as boom, 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 right? So that outer silhouette changes everything. You know, if you're looking at the back of somebody's head, like you see this in film a lot, where you have a film frame, and then you see the back of somebody's head, you kind of see like that shape with an ear. Maybe sometimes you see the nose in there peeking out. What makes it recognizable is not any particular person's head, it's just that shape. Because you're, you recognize the, that contour, that silhouette. And that silhouette can even be blurred and in shadow, and you'll still recognize it. And so that's what you want to pay attention to. One of the mistakes that I see people do in the beginning is when they draw like a water bottle or something, they do this right here. And then you just continue it kind of down. And then maybe they get the water bottle like that, and it kind of winds up looking pretty non-specific. So we want to ditch that habit as soon as possible and make it unique through the silhouette. Um, let's see here. Uh, 
Um, I don't recommend putting, you know, using figures. But if you have, if you are dead set on using figures, there's a particular way that I want you to do it. I want you to think about the figure as breaking down into these basic shapes. You know, this is this is a very beginner drawing thing, right? That you desperately want to draw figures, and everything else just can't compare to to being that interesting. There's this idea of the the star figure. that actually works really well. Um, what it winds up being is you think of the figure as, you know, taking an action, like, I don't know, stretching. And you wind up sketching them like that. So that's all fine. But what we can do is we can take this guy, we can, um, copy him, go back to our landscape, um, we can add another layer and paste them in and, you know, put him in here. Maybe he's the ranger and just got out of the house. And actually, we should probably rotate him a little bit because that looks a little weird move it just a bit so we kind of see him maybe he's right there see he's kind of in a bad spot right there so maybe the door is over here maybe we should move him over here maybe he's coming out and doing yoga I don't know I don't want to put him like right here but to do that, I would need to like erase a little bit here. So I'd say, well, all right, let me kill the background a little bit so he can be hanging out there by himself, right? So if you're dead set on putting figures, put them in there tiny and use the star man thing because it's so small anyway that it doesn't, that you can't get the full detail and you can't really, you haven't studied it yet, maybe. So you can't even draw the full detail. So, you know, for now, just stick to this, right? Throw in the little star man. You know, put him in, doing whatever action you need him to do. You know, use him as another layer of overlap, right? And don't think of it as this big intimidating figure thing, okay? So that's a good way to get started in, in figure drawing without too much uh, pain and suffering. Because once you get into figure drawing, uh, you're starting to juggle a lot of different concepts. Um, let me think if there's anything else. So we're talking about, you know, our basic subjects, objects, perspective, and and all of that. Um, you know, a lot of people get really bored with perspective, but perspective can get interesting, especially when you start doing cool stuff like um, start thinking of like, well, I want to. I want to put make something happen and it needs to be in an environment so one of the things that I was working on earlier was this idea for a shot or for a storyboard that you would actually be looking through a helicopter an old Huey in the Vietnam War I'm trying to storyboard out Vietnam War stories that my neighbor told me from being a green green beret and so you would need perspective here to like show the interior of a Huey. Doesn't even have to be great for it to work, you know? And then this could actually be the horizon and you could have your little star man like running here to get into the helicopter, you know? And the helicopter's here, you know, and the, the skids are hanging out like that, right? And so this little bit of perspective right here kind of just sells this idea.
right? So perspective doesn't have to be like drab and boring, and it shouldn't be drab and boring because it's basically the most useful thing you have in your toolkit. Um, one of the other notes on perspective is if you're going to use a ruler, um, you can use it in this really simple way. So let's say this is your uh, paper here. And let's say you're doing a one point perspective drawing with the horizon here and your vanishing points here. Oops. So what you can do is use your ruler to create your first setup. And once you have this sort of setup going, you can then ditch your ruler, right? Then, now that you have this setup, you can say, well, this is a plane. I kind of know where my horizon line is. I can eliminate some of the horizon line. I can erase some construction lines. I can start to clean this up a little bit. So now without a ruler, I know that I could go in and I could say, like, knock in a street. I could say, well, okay, well, this street turns here. There's a little arc. And then the sidewalk needs to have some depth. So I could have that going in. Right? So now I can kind of freehand draw on that perspective bit that I've set up. And I don't have to worry about anything being, like, super wrong at this point. You know, so I say this is a small building with a seven foot tall door. You know, the door has a little inset here. There's a window on the door. There's a little handle. Um, you know, maybe there's like a sign. And it's an old school sign that actually goes out here. Well, here, let me move it up because I'm creating a tangent here, and that's bad. And the sign like actually hangs out on a frame and dangles down like that. And then. You know, I could think about, well, all right, what's on the other side of the street? I could say, well, that street ends. And then maybe it's just like, you know, far distance landscape stuff. Like trees and things. Maybe there's a park back there or something. I don't know. And then, you know, if I need to, I could put like, you know, bins or other boxy objects in here just to like liven up the space a little bit. I could say, well, all right, well, there's probably going to be like, you know, boxy air conditioning units or, you know, antenna or something like that on top of these things. You know, maybe this one's got like an actual satellite dish. So you can take a, a sort of a, a dry approach to perspective, you know, you don't not using the ruler for everything, and then enliven it by just using the the ruled out architecture from the first like five to ten lines, and then make it more interesting and more unique by freehanding on top of it. Um, and then you notice that all this overlap is happening too, right? Because we're taking this idea that we have a plane here. And then we're saying, okay, well, the street shape overlaps that, right? Because we're doing, we're doing this again. So we're just taking this concept, connecting it back to overlap, and we're just doing it in perspective. And then here, right here, we're doing it with a box, right? That's this shape. And then we have this guy going here and continuing. So we got overlap there, and then we are overlapping again. So 
to the street itself. So a very complex set of overlaps there, which is really fun and cool. So, you know, anytime you think about this stuff, you're thinking in basic in basic ideas of overlap and overlapping shape and overlapping form. Um, and that keeps it simple and easy to manage. And now if you need, um, you know, if you need to do a landscape that shows a lot more depth, you may want to think about the landscape as a perspective drawing itself. So if you say horizons like here or something and you have stuff going on and you've got a pathway and maybe like you've got people running on the pathway, right? Not that you'd need to be really drawing figures, but your landscape can also go in perspective, right? So your landscape can chill back here and be really small. And then you could have shrubberies that kind of, you know, get bigger as they come forward, right? And then you could have little teeny trees in the background, little pine trees sticking up. And then they get bigger the more forward you come. So now we're taking this idea that these things are going in perspective as well along this line. And then we're saying, okay, well, since this is kind of a one point shot, maybe you've got like uh, some big bushes like right here in the foreground, right? And they're kind of blocking a lot of stuff, but then maybe there's actually like another even bigger tree right here. So now you're thinking of landscape as having properties of perspective too. That's where things start to get really interesting because now you're thinking in terms of connecting ideas to each other to buy yourself more depth. Okay. And you know, if you can do this in drawing one, you're in really good shape or at least start thinking about it. Right. I don't expect you to be perfect at any of this in drawing one. I just expect you to, to try these basic techniques, right? And start thinking in terms of, well, how can I simplify it down to make it understandable so that I can draw it, right? Because you can draw things like, you can draw circles and you can draw shapes, right? You can draw wonky circles. And you can draw squiggles around the wonky circle to kind of make it look more tree-ish, right? You can draw this overlap diagram. You know, you can draw this overlap diagram with a triangle, right? Now, the last thing I wanted to introduce you to the idea of after all of this overlap stuff is that when we combine overlap with the idea of foreground, middle ground, background, and we combine that with form, what we tend to do is do it in a three, two, one kind of way. So we would say like, you know, let's say we have a, you know, a bush in the foreground, right? And we got lighting here. We could spend a lot of time doing really good lighting on this bush here. And we could be sure that we're showing kind of like its dimension. So it has like a top of the bush. And we could think of this as a three-sided box, just like bushy. So this could be quite dark. This could be kind of lighter. Maybe the bush isn't the best example for this. Let's do this as a rock. So 
let's say we have a rock that's kind of like more complicated. It was like a landscaping rock that someone carted in. So now we have a three-sided rock, right? And it's in the foreground, so that kind of makes sense, right? Now, let's say behind that we have a building. Say it's like a tiny shed. We overlap it and we show two sides. So we have three, two sides, right? So we see this little shed. Generic shed, but that's all right. Then in the background, we say, all right, well, we see mountains and things in the background. So this, so we go three sides, two sides, one side, foreground, middle ground, background. And what that does is it tends to very quickly separate these and make it really clear and easy to read, right? So now it's like, you can definitely tell what's what by having this foreground, middle ground, background. We combine that with dark, medium, light, and we do some really sophisticated sophisticated things. Um, so that's going to be it for this, uh, for this sort of lecture. I know it's a little bit long um, and we covered a lot, but I just wanted to go back through and, and show you all the layers that we drew um, just so we get a refresher. But here we're talking about basic shapes, basic forms, and even within one form like this tree, we're um, able to use multiple concepts of flat and dimensional. Here, um, we're talking about our overlapping with more interesting shapes and the way that light overlaps. We're also talking about dividing into light and dark using those forms for organic, for organic shapes. This is the rock walking over the hill. This is Tenzin using basic overlapping shapes. This is connecting perspective to simple shapes like triangles. This is the idea that you can mix it all together, use objects and landscape. Um, and use the idea that you have close together and farther away and you're using big, medium, and small shapes as well. Um, and then here we added our little person. Right Here we started talking about the silhouette and the, the outer edge. Here we were trying to make perspective more interesting and talk about the star man idea. Um, here we're talking about mixing perspective, objects, and landscape all in one and how that's all really just using basic shapes and overlap still. Here we're talking about using perspective in landscape, and here we're talking about three, two, and one-sided objects and where they should go in the foreground, middle ground, and background. So that's it. Uh, I hope you got through all of this and took some good notes, and uh, I hope you try it out and enjoy it.